Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to another Clue Order Jazz Holiday Foundation's Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions. I am your host, Michael Kernodal, and today we have a special, special treat for everyone. I'm glad you, you joined in with us live. Today's guests are Jeremy Carter and Sam Dillon, and the session is part of our Conversation With series. So we're going to have a conversation with Jeremy Carter and Sam Dillon today. Uh, thank you for joining us. I know you're super excited about this. And before we move on, you know, if you're joining us live and we love interaction, there's a little feature there that's called chat. If you have questions or comments, uh, please go in, ask any questions, and we're going to leave some time um, somewhere in the middle or the end where our educators and our musicians can answer anything you may have. Um, I want to remind you that this would not be possible without our awesome, awesome sponsors. So please be sure to check out the studio archives of our past video sessions at clearwaterjazz.com's education outreach section. And that's brought to you by Blue Water Wealth Management at Stewart Partners and Duke Energy, as well as the Young Lions podcast available wherever you stream. And that's brought to you by our friends at Marine Max Clearwater. So just search Young Lines Jazz Master Virtual Sessions. I mean, where do I start? I mean, we have two phenomenal musicians here and educators. Uh, we're going to start with Jeremy Carter. If you don't know who Jeremy Carter is, uh, he is one of the most sought after saxophonists in Tampa Bay area. Um, incredible performer. He's also active with Clearwater Jazz Holidays Education Partner. Uh, he's participating in many of our outreach programs, including the Young Lives Jazz Master Virtual Sessions, History of Jazz Outre Outreach Program, and My Journey with Jazz Program. I mean, the Jeremy Carter Band has been a regular at Clearwater Jazz uh, Wanderlust Series and all over the Tampa Bay area and throughout the country. And some of Jeremy's past instructional sessions include beginners, intermediate and advanced tenor sax, deliberate verse in, versus intentional improvisation and musical color wheel. That was a great one. I set in on that one. He's also done some of our other conversation series with people like James Suggs, uh, Mike Tucker or Terrence Martin. Martin. That was a great one too. And of course, mm -hmm. today's returning guest, Sam Dillon. If you don't know who this man is Sam is a saxophonist, woodwind player, composer, and teacher based in New York City. In 2013, Sam was selected as a semifinalist in the Thelonious Monk International Saxophone Competition. As a semifinalist, Sam performed at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. for Wayne Shorter, Jimmy Heath, Branford Marcellus, Bobby Watson, and Jane Ira Bloom. Most notably, Sam has performed at Carnegie Hall Jazz at Lincoln Center, Symphony, Symphony Space, uh, Smoke Jazz Club. I mean, the list goes on and on. Yoshi's Jazz Club, Small's Jazz Club. He's absolutely everywhere. <laughs> in 2009, Sam received his master's in jazz performance from SUNY Purchase College, as well as leading his own, own groups. Sam has had the honor of performing with Joe Chambers, Moving Pictures Jazz Orchestra, the Smoke Big Band, the Artie Shaw Jazz Orchestra, and so much more. So if you want to know more about Sam, you can also go to his website, which is www.samdillonmusic.com. You know what? I think you've heard enough from me today. You, maybe you want to hear from these guys. So I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy and also Sam. And guys, the stage is all yours. Michael, thank you so much for that introduction. I don't know what to do now. Um, yeah. That was, yeah. <laughs> Wow, I feel very, I feel so important. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a great introduction, and uh, I guess I guess it, it it goes to show you that if you just keep doing your thing, yeah. When, looking back, always always looks like you you've maybe done a lot when you just keep going. You right. Know? Yeah. So, yeah. Once again, thanks to Mike. Thanks to Clearwater Jazz Holiday for putting this on. Thanks to Sam for coming back with us. Uh, again, for another session, Sam and I have done a couple other sessions that's uh, on the Clearwater Jazz Holiday uh, uh, Education and Outreach page. Uh, we've covered a couple other topics. Um, and today we're going to be talking about sound development. And uh, who better to have than Sam Dillon, one of the guys who's 
in my opinion, one of the best tenor saxophone sounds on the scene today. And uh, yeah, is this this should be exciting for uh, for those of you who are tuning in, or if you go back and uh, check it out uh, in the archives. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much for having me, man. Uh, it's always an honor and uh, a special time to come periodically back to the Clearwater Jazz Festival. Thanks to Michael also and uh, and everyone there because uh, really what this is all about as far as I'm concerned, and I know as far as you're concerned, is the learning process. And uh, we're all always watching and learning from each other. And mm -hmm. uh, to get to kind of have these conversations with you, it really uh, inspires me to get back into the shed and, and, and think about this stuff. Because uh, half the time, uh, all the stuff that's in our head, when we get to talk about it, it kind of somehow codifies it and organizes it in our head so we can really kind of structure our practice time maybe a little better. Uh, and this interview is no exception because you, you hit me up and you said, Hey, we're going to talk about sound. And I said, damn, well, <laughs> I have, I haven't spoken about just sound for like uh, an hour and a half or whatever. Right. for a really long time because it's going to be related to all the things saxophone but it, it did make make me think about uh a few things uh that i i like to uh, uh think about as far as sound goes um and uh, uh a conversation like this is great to organize a specific you know uh, uh a zone of the saxophone that way uh, right. but i also felt like i wanted to ask you about sound too to be honest <laughs> so, i mean I, I, you know, you're asking me. I'm, I'm, I'm also uh, very, very, very curious to hear what you have to say about your sound production as also, uh, you know, a an, uh, saxophonist with a phenomenal tenor sound. I hear that, and I'm like, yeah, he's he's doing everything the right way. You know, wow. that, that, Thanks, that, that, you know, I, you know, play the horn. So, yeah, yeah, man, I dig, I dig it. Yeah, thanks so much, man. Um, yeah, I usually, I, I try to keep it pretty simple, man. Um, I don't really mess around with my gear too much. Um, you know, obviously you produce the sound. I mean, your your equipment's going to help you out a little bit, um, but it's it's ultimately, a, you know, how you shape your, your mouth cavity and, you know, and your support of the breath. And then I think, that I, you know, I maybe skipped a step. The most important part, I think, is like, you have to kind of have that sound concept in your head. You got to know what you want to sound like. And like, yeah. is it you or is it just like, have you been listening to a bunch of Jimmy Heath records or, you know what I'm saying? Have you been listening to Johnny Griffin and then all of a sudden you're doing this thing, right? And like, is the sound that you're hearing of your own, you know? So I think that's like the most important part before I even pick up the horn. Like I kind of have an idea of what I want my thing to kind of sound like, you know? Yeah. And, and, um, uh, I think, I think that, that, that is a really kind of, uh, 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 a profound realization because I get the question as I'm sure you do all the time. What, what equipment are you using? Right. Yeah. What What are you using? What are you using? And it's it's interesting because on one hand, equipment matters, and it's really important. And then on another hand, it doesn't matter at all. No. Because and the reason I say that to all the students, anyone out there watching, is because we have an idea of the sound in our head. We have an idea of what we want to be projecting, how we want that to come across. And then we have an idea of how the equipment is supposed to feel. The feeling of the equipment doesn't necessarily mean it sounds how you want it to sound. Yeah. So we're actually playing a game of fooling ourselves into thinking that we're playing something that feels how we want it to sound when they're two different things. Right. And, and when you find something that uh, feels and sounds like how you think it should, that's, you know, that's what you're going for. But the point is, is that just because it feels right 
or just because it feels wrong doesn't necessarily mean that it either sounds good or bad. Right. There's, there's, there, it, that, that's kind of like an obtuse, meaningless correlation on some level that we yeah. drive ourselves crazy about, you know? So uh, there's that, which points to the first thing that we're talking about, which is sound is coming from you. What your experience is listening to the saxophone, what your experience is uh, listening to the great players who you want to emulate, that's going to talk to you. That's going to tell you something. And I'm going to be totally real with everyone. We all have our preferences when we were, when we were young. I mean, if you're coming to the game late and maybe you have a little more of a mature attitude about it and that might be a different thing. But when I was eight years old, I listened to Sonny Rollins and Sonny Stitt on eternal triangle. And I was like, wow, Sonny Stitt sounds better, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. And I, I, I'm not, you know, let's be real now. Of course, I mean, you know, the rhythmic variety, the, the, the depth in Sonny Rollins' tone, uh, you know, that's a silly, immature argument. But the point is, is that Jimmy Heath told me once, what you hear is what you like. And that means that it's not about what's better or worse. It's, it's what speaks to you. Yeah. Because there were, there were plenty of kids that listened to Eternal Triangle. Uh, I remember they were like, no, no, it's sunny, man. It's sunny. And, and you know, and, and even though those debates are, are fun, but also silly, what, what it really means to, the, to us as artists learning that stuff and growing from that stuff is that we are hearing what we like. Though it's, 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 a, it's a reflection of our taste. And it's right. a reflection of it's a reflection of what we're going to become, you know. And so, if my preference, just initially, for whatever reason, for whatever God-given taste that I was given, is Sonny Stitt, you got to go with that. Right. You got and, and you got you got to see that through. You got to see that through to the end, and then eventually, when you really go through that and you get there, you will come back and and realize how great Sonny, Sonny Rollins is and, right. and stupid it is to think one is the be better than the other. But at the same time, you do have to honor your taste. And, and um, uh, uh, as Miles said, you know, music is all style. So th it's, there's a lot of truth to that. You, you, your sound is your style and you right. have to, you have to honor that. You know, you have to honor what's in your head. You have to honor who you are. You have to honor what you're hearing and what makes you say to yourself, I want to be able to do that. You got to You got to have that kind of self-confidence. And it doesn't mean that you're looking down on the things that don't necessarily appeal to you. It doesn't right. mean that. It just means that you're going with who you are. It's a, you're, you're a mirror of all of the things that you've internalized in your, in your process you know right yeah absolutely and to me that sounds you know yeah i mean uh yeah that's that's really really articulately but um yeah i mean you could i mean even as a tenor player there are certain things uh in terms of sound uh conception like uh that you might take from an alto or a soprano player uh yeah. just maybe something in the way that they rhythmic like Bradford marsalis for instance or, you know, I mean, as Andrew, you know what I mean? Like all these guys, you know, the alto players, soprano players, there's something about like the attack and the decay of their note, the, the, the rhythmic variety, like you were talking about, just the way that they phrase. There's something you can take from them. Like it doesn't just have to be a tenor player where you're thinking about sound concept because it's like so many different elements uh, that go into it, you know? Oh man, yeah. I mean, even like, like, for example, you just made me think McCoy's articulation. Exactly. Like McCoy lends its great is, is that those lines to, 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 to saxophone or like even, you know, I've had the thought and I'm sure other saxophone, there's something about the way the trumpet, like Woody or Freddie will play a line and the, the, it, there's just weight behind it, you know? And yeah. then, and I heard, I heard Brecker, say that part of his sound he wanted to be able to have 
some of that cut of a trumpet the way the but because saxophone kind of didn't have that kind of cut like you know right. even even when a trumpet is playing soft there's something about the delivery that has that kind of like it cuts cuts yeah. through and uh uh he was talking about how he wanted to he was trying to have some of that in his sound in one of the interviews i saw and i i, I feel that way you know like i want to i want to be able to do that so you know um Originally, I started like Blue Train had such an influence on me. And what I what I would do was I had one of those machines that would hold out the note. So it would go, you know, bo bo ba bo ba. Right. And that, that's my that's that E flat. Ba. That's always been my sound reference. The uh the way I, I would listen to the way that note spoke when it was in uh, uh, unison with Curtis right. and Lee, but then I would also listen to it when it goes to the harmony and I would just go the, uh, and I would, I would be sitting there trying to find a read that sounded like that. And I, I man, I would just obsessed with trying to get that kind of sound quality in my, in my playing. And for whatever reason, at that age, eight, nine, 10, 11, I mean, forever, really. But but back then, trying to figure out a way to get that level of resonance on that, right. that F through the whole horn. Yeah. Like, almost, almost for me, as if you didn't want to be able to tell what note it is. You know, sometimes you can hear a saxophone player play, and you know it's an A because we know the timbre. Right. Like my goal is to almost be timbreless, wow. you know, or like like almost almost have it be so fluid that you can't really tell what right. note it is in a way. Like have it be that clear. And you know, I don't know if this is hooked up, but is that too loud? No, no, it's fine. Okay. So just be able to have that kind of presence through the whole range of the horn. Right. Uh, and uh, that led me to realizing that th this uh, is not supposed to move really too much. That right. the voicing comes from the back of our throat, our tongue. But as, as, as the great Jared Briganzi says, the best embouchure is a no, no embouchure embouchure. You know, I'm <laughs> sure I don't know if we've all seen that clip, but right. he's just like, yeah, you should look. And I tell all my students too, if you eat a, a you know, a bowl of cereal in the morning and you, and you, you 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 bring this soup spoon or the spoon up to your mouth and your mouth is like this like i'm saying something stupid and my students love that when i'm like i'm saying something you know they're like ah -ha. so but you're looking like that's how i feel like the you're supposed to feel right because right. the sound is almost from here and in your head this is just supposed to be kind of like a, a, a vehicle for the air to move through. And if right. you're obtruding that in any way, it's going to, it's going to either pinch or not. So that's my big thing. I, I don't want my high D to sound like a high D even maybe even more so than like how you might be able to tell it's an open palm with train. I want my thing to just completely sound like what, wait, what note is that? Like, even if it's in C sharp to just be right. like oh, easy because that's the other, it is related to train though, because train will be playing some chromatic out stuff and it still sounds like the most lyrical melodic thing ever. But yeah. it's like, it's like, like some out, out stuff, even, even, you know, in miles, like the way he uses chromaticism, and puts certain notes in there it's it's wild but 
on first listen and second listen, it does just sound like it's a scale, you know, right. and, and Brecker has that very strong quality to his playing too, where it, it it's like, Oh yeah. That, you know, first listen. Oh, it's like, yeah, he's just playing up a scale. And it's like, no, 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 uh, no. But that quality of not, not necessarily exploiting the harmony that way and having that kind of like fluid sound uh, to me, that's like appealing. It's almost like, it's almost like the notes don't matter. And right. the, iron, the irony of it, irony of it is that you're playing like the hippest shit you can play, but it's not, it's not about that. It's about, it's about just the sound. It's literally about the sound, you know? Right. So that, that's kind of where I've, I've always kind of uh, come from at least, you know? Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of things that go into that. Just the, the harmonic knowledge and comfort level to play yeah. with that kind of fluidity. You know what I mean? Yes. You know, to, to kind of be elusive. Like another example I, I like to use is Seamus Blake. Oh. Like, you know, he's kind of dancing oh. around. It's like, it's just so angular. You know what I mean? It's like, wow, what is going on here? I mean, that that is, yeah, Seamus is my, is, you know, all of our, heroes i'm not but you know it's like you know and you know the one thing that he i you know from i, I don't i don't know him too well personally i, I ran into him at smalls a few times and yeah. you know I'm asked him some stuff but uh you know he's always talking about melody yeah and and and, and singing through the yeah. horn so yeah there's and and i mean you know, the sound, that sound speaks for itself. Like, you know, exactly. I took uh, a lesson with him when I was up in New York one time, one of my trips up there. Yeah. I, I took a lesson with him. It was just like, wow. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was pretty ridiculous, man. Yeah. And I, I noticed, I noticed too, that he's, he's kind of got that, that, uh, this kind of thing. I, I don't know if he ever did this, but here's one, here's one little like nerdy technical thing that I, I try to, mess around with for all the students out there is trying to play a scale a half step lower than what you're fingering. Ugh. So if I play a C scale, and I keep the same fingering, but I try, I try to make that scale sound like a B major scale. So, right. It's hard, but Whoa. I was just thinking the C scale. <laughs> so the whole idea, and I actually did, I, I bought one of his like my masterclass things. Mm -hmm. He's talking about seeing the notes as, as though he's, he's uh, a male dancer, ballerina. <laughs> holding up a, oh, he talks that... about this, and like, he's holding up the note. Right. Right. So, so, you're 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 looking at these notes as, as though you're holding them up from from below, right? And uh, uh, it, it 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 I thought that was a great analogy because when you go back and like listen to like Dexter, which I you know you can hear in in Seamus playing and or right. Trent, they they have that kind of like open uh, thing where. The, even if the note is actually sharp in and of itself, their embouchure is still so open and and wide that it still sounds like it's in tune because they're 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 voicing the note from below, right? right. And 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 this is open, and that's just it's a vehicle for letting the air speak through the horn a, as best as you can. So right. again, it comes down to the you know that exercise helps me to keep the the embouchure open and and allow the air to flow through the horn and again when you start to activate your ear it does help you to get a bigger fuller sound on that c you know when you normally might not uh i mean that's you know that's just a middle c but that has right. a, like a you 
you want to be coming at it from below. I hear that in your tone very well too. You know, it's, you're not trying to, when, when you're, when you're getting the thing to really speak, it's not uh, coming at it from above. Like a, yes. it, it's like a, the, the, uh, uh or right. ah, ah, uh-huh. is really syllable. it's an ah. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Um, so what, the uh, what are you playing on now? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So th- this is a still the SK origin. Okay. Uh, 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 it, it, it's his or, original uh, kind of model of a uh, of a link. Okay. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's just a seven star. It's a rollover baffle, slight rollover baffle. Uh, right now I'm experimenting with Lavaz reeds. This is a medium hard Lavaz. It might actually be a little too hard for me. I was mm-hmm. usually playing a, uh, just a three medium Rico jazz select. And this is a, uh, uh, Ishimori ligature. Okay. Uh, the reason I like the Ishimori ligature is because this is just basically a piece of metal, you right. know, on the mouthpiece. And I'm all about keeping it simple. As far as ligatures go, I just want a piece of metal that holds the reed on. Um, and uh, that's basically it. Basically, a me- middle middle of the road setup. Nothing nothing too crazy. Yeah. Uh, very similar to the older link. Yeah, very similar to to the Florida link. This yeah. is a, basically a copy of the Florida link. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's still it's still the Yamaha uh, artist model that I'm playing. I just got yeah. more comfortable on it. So hey, you, uh, st- you still have your six, no? I got rid of my six. Yeah. So, look, I mean, for the students that are listening, uh, you don't have to get a Mark VI to get a great sound, you know? It's not really about that. Don't think you got to go out and, you know, hit your parents up and go through all these changes and leverage your future (laughs) just to get a horn. That's not really what what it's all about. You know, if if there's some aesthetic attraction, if it just makes you feel better to do that, um, sure, but I mean, maybe sometime down the road, but I would just suggest practicing, you know, you might not even find that all that's all that effort is worth it, you know. Right. And it's the same principle that we were talking about, like, this is all great. And I love this mouthpiece, but it's it's about what's in your head. Yeah. For, 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 for the students out there, I, I agree with what, what Jeremy's saying completely, you know, the the horn itself is going to start to become part of you. I feel more comfortable on this horn now, three years later than I did when I first got it, which I was like thinking to myself, everyone's going to be thinking, wow, well, Sam went to a Yamaha, what's going on there? <laughs> but I did, I, I did it. And, uh, you know, it start, it start a, a lot of what I was feeling that I think is uh, better about this horn is actually starting to uh, come uh, come, come to the surface. Now it's a right. little more, it's a little, it's even more even than a six because a six is handmade. So th- yeah. there's, there's a benefit to that. And I think we, you know, we might've mentioned this in the last, uh, uh, class we did, but train, Sonny, Dexter, Brecker, well, not Brecker, but everyone we're talking about, they were the original owners of the horn they had. Maybe Brecker was, I don't know, right. but right. you got to think about, you know, Sonny or, or, or train going into the sick, you know, Selma shop and having 10 brand new S- SBAs to choose from. I mean, that's right. incredible stuff, but saying, I want that one. And they were the first owner. They were able to tweak it and have their way of playing their spit. You know, your everything affects the horn that you're playing when yeah. you start to play it and you really get into it. So there's something to be said for the students out there of making the instrument yours, making it your first horn, loving that instrument, you know? And, and if you spend the time, you can get whatever sound is in your head on any instrument you want. And if you put in that kind of time, when you do start to get to a place of experimenting with equipment, it's going to be that much more interesting for you because when you do get new equipment for a second, you're going to, you're going to get, uh, maybe a little more something that you wanted and your sound's going to develop over time, but you're always going to end up sounding like yourself eventually. 
You know, yeah. you're, it's going to come back to that that quality that you have. You know, that's yes. special. It's funny you say that, but that you were uh, uh, just now kind of starting to get into, or you're still d- discovering things about your horde three years on. I'm yeah. in the same exact situation. I got this horde about three years ago, and I kind yeah. of still feel like I'm unlocking things, you know? I'm just now beginning to learn how to play the dang thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and all the all the nuances, like the, you know, okay, the A kind of sits a little low there. And the, you know, it it takes a while, especially with the vintage horns, because right, they're not, uh, you know, they're not made like the modern horns, like the Yamahas, the Nagasawas. The scale is so even, you know. Right. It's just like you, it just feels right, you know. Right. So what what it, what, what, what kind what horn is that? This is what Mark Six. Um, oh, it's a Mark. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is a this, this is a good one. It's a relacquer, but it's a really really good relacquer that was done in the seventies. So okay. it still kind of got that honey patina, right? And, and all the lacquerware is pretty much mine. I got this from the original owner, and it wow. came with like the warranty card and stuff like that from the Soviet wow. factory. Wow. Yeah. And he, and he never really played it. I'm still friends. Well, he, he passed away not too long ago, but I'm still friends with the family. And um, the, his son was just saying, like, yeah, I, he played a little bit, but he basically just took it out. He was really out to play. I got an old soprano from him, too. Um, but he just used to take it out after, after he played it, you know, for maybe a year or two when he first got it. He would take it out on Christmas and just chase the kids around the house with it. <laughs> Yeah, right, right. He, he never really played it. Like all the key touches are like the pearls are still wow. sharp. It just feels wow. like it's Man, amazing. Ne- that's a crazy story. I've never heard of uh, getting a horn with the warranty. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's got like the. I think I have a picture of it up on my on my Instagram page, but it's got like the silver's warranty uh, certificate, like from the factory. The case looks immaculate. It's got that old leather wow. case but with like it's got a like a like a vinyl cover for the outside of it that zips around it too. it's got dude it's just all the bells and whistles i could be happier wow great yeah it, yeah and i haven't really gotten it properly overhauled so i mean it's still kind of i think when i first got it it may have had some original pads on it okay that's yeah. cool yeah so, I mean, but it, yeah, it plays word word, word I, I learned this actually actually from bill singer in the city uh i don't i, may, I hope may, maybe you did maybe you didn't but if it had the original pads you want to you want to try to save those really yeah yeah Why, because of the boosters be, well because of the boosters that come that come on it yeah those are valuable so are if they? Still, yeah if you still know that cat that did it you could go back to it and be like hey man i'll buy you a, a new uh, set of pads but can i have those old ones back because those are no, valuable yeah i'm yeah. pretty sure i have them laid around somewhere Cool, cool, yeah. So those, yeah. those are good. If they can try to uh, get new pads and put those boosters back in with the original, uh, you know, the original, uh, 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 you know, uh, metal resonator. Resonant, yeah. I didn't know that. Keeps, yeah, it keeps it more a little more uh, original yeah. sound. And, you know, right. uh, Bill, Singer, Bill Singer's the cat as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah. you know, he uh, he's a good guy to hit up. And is that neck? uh yeah what, what, that's a that's a silver solid silver neck wow and, and that's yeah. a, is that an sba or what is it no it's uh it's a neck i got from this guy in china uh he, he was the same guy that you i don't know if you remember i was playing on a copper neck i think the last time yeah we talked right. yep. for the same guy uh arnold wang uh okay. in china from from eastern winds or eastern music Okay. He makes some really, really hip stuff, man. He's got all kinds of crazy stuff. I just, uh, I just recently started playing alto again. I just picked up this horn from him. It's wow. like a, it's it's a Mark Six copy, but like the bell and the bottom bow are like golden, and then the middle has got this like vintified look to it. Wow. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Wow. Yeah. Mouthpiece and ligature too. Damn, man. It, the cr- crystal uh, Dukov. Yeah. Like vintage Miami Duke off. Wow. Yeah, man. So I dude, I'm totally geeked out. Like I mean, I'm I'm definitely love- like saxophoned out, you know. Great, great. That's killing. Yeah, but yeah, but ultimately after all that, I mean you just have to play. You know what I mean? Like all that stuff is great, but you gotta get some hours in, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. You got to get some hours in for and and you know, half of it is about. You know, it's so funny. We do this the the, the whole class on all of the harmony and all of the stuff that you can play, and uh, uh, it is so important to be free with that kind of information. And I think a lot of the time, you know, you see these debates online, people get into arguments about patterns versus melody and that kind of stuff. And my whole take on it, and I think, you know, really the best player's take on it is that when, when you learn a pattern, it's not necessarily for the sake of the pattern itself. You're, you're learning something that is going to be setting some kind of foundation for yourself to actually be able to be more free. It's like, uh, you know, running a a play in football where you're going to make sure that, you know, the quarterback's timing is perfect when that, wide receiver turns around just for a second and the ball is going to be right there. When you practice that you're, you're allowing yourself to the best chance to be able to uh, be free with that kind of system in the moment when game time comes. Right. So it's not really uh, restrictive when you, when you start to see things that way. And the same thing applies with your sound. You, you, you don't want to be restricted in, uh, I think, uh, getting caught up in sounding like your, your uh, I don't know, even though sound is even more abstract, so it's hard to say, but like, like almost sounding like you're deliberately trying to voice a note. You, you want that to be free too. You almost, it's almost like getting to some kind of, weird place where after all of the scrutiny and after all of the analysis over everything, you really have to not give a shit yeah. <laughs> about, about anything, man. Cause when, right. when you do that and you allow yourself to be a vehicle for what you're trying to express in the moment and, and just be part of uh, connecting to the people around you and the musicians around you, that's when, your true sound, that's when your true ideas come. And we're constantly dealing with this kind of psychological uh, shift that needs to happen where we're thinking about all these details in the practice room, we're thinking about all the harmony, we're thinking about sound, we're thinking about phrasing, we're thinking about all of these things. And then being able to just be like, you know what? It's about it's about the bigger picture. Yeah. The, all, all of that is supposed to be uh, 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 ingredients and, and food for the pot of soup that you're cooking, you know? Right. And I, I'm going to steal, this is another analogy that uh, from Seamus, because he, he, he says, you know, you're, you're, we're adding ingredients into our, uh, our, our, our pot of soup. And when you, when you taste the soup, when it's cooked, you can't distinguish all the ingredients. Right. You just, you just taste it. And when you first start the soup, that's when you can say, okay, there's celery, there's all these carrot, you know, carrots, tomato sauce, whatever you put in it. But right. at the end, it's just, it gels together. Yeah. And, and, and for me, that's kind of how I want my sound to be. And you can refine those things through playing, through patterns, through exercises, but you, everyone out there has to keep in mind that the goal is not to prove those things in and of themselves. The goal is to learn those things so well that at some point after practice, they come, they come out, right? It's right. not for me to get up here and be able to shred in front of everyone. Even though I, I can, the, 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 the goal it, like right now, if I play like play a blues to demonstrate my sound, I don't know what I'm going to play. At some point, I did know what I was going to do, though, right? Right. And at some point, I had that worked out, but it was with the idea and the understanding that I was going to get to a place where it was just going to be in there. 
it was just gonna, it was gonna, uh, I was planting, planting seeds for myself with the sound. Right. And you have to be patient and you have to let those things grow and you have to keep, continue to just play and experience music and, and continue to, to just, just do, do, do what you're doing. And, right. uh, you, through that process, you start to kind of become, uh, more of yourself, you know? Right. Uh, uh, and it's important for students to, to realize that because you could get a good mouthpiece, you can spend eight hours a day practicing and you can learn your train solo and then you can still not sound good. And you can be like, what, you know, <laughs> right. Carter told me to do all these things. he's not a good teacher. And it's like, <laughs> no, 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 it, it's not. It, it, he, he, he's helping you to, uh, put your ingredients together right. and added step that you need is to start to take uh, uh, some some joy in watching that soup cook. Yeah, that stuff comes together it by itself. Right, and that's kind of the beauty of it. You you when you throw some in ingredients in there, and you you got to let that cook. You got to let it cook. You know. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, that that that's hard for younger people. Right, because you know, you're kind of hard. impatient. It's hard for us. It's hard for us sometimes too. So right, you know. Anyway, I think I think I think one of the the, the main things, or one of the first things that I do in terms of like uh, sound development, now that I think about it, um, and this helps out a couple of different things. Um, it, when I get on the horn, I usually just try to play a low B flat. Yeah, like subtone to B flat. Like it kind of tells me where my chops are. And you know where everything is, and it tells well, if, there's, if the horn's leaking, you're not going to be able to get it out, right? You know what I mean. So it's a it's a good test of your equipment, and it's a, just a good test of your chops. Like if you can, I, I know like whenever it, I see these discussions about sound online or somebody's doing, you know, people get into it. They're always talking about long toes, and then people will make fun of the idea, and. I just think it's like silly to like, that's really where it's at. That's the best thing that you can do to develop your cell because you, you can almost feel it take shape as you're playing these long toes. Right. And if that just becomes too boring for you, if you, if you're not the type of person that can just sit there and do that, play balance. There's so yes. many low, you know, just play balance. Yeah. You know, yeah, that, that's, that's a great point. And I come back to that too. Like, uh, again, not only with sound, but with all the technical stuff that we're learning and practicing or two fives, people say, I want to do a, a two five shed. I want to do this. Everyone out there do everything on a tune. People aren't doing this stuff. People aren't applying this stuff to tunes as much. So Mr. Carter is right. Like play a ballad because then you're practicing your tone in a real way. It's not just this boring thing. But I also agree with you about that B flat. Dave Liebman tells a, a, this amazing story about Sonny Rollins trying out Mark sixes. And he had the Selmer guy come to his hotel room. And this guy was so excited because he thought he was going to hear Sonny playing all day in the mm -hmm. hotel. And right. Sonny, the whole time, I don't know if you heard this story or not, but it's, no, I don't no. but the whole time Sonny was just playing low B flats just to yeah. test the horn. And yeah. so it's, it's kind of funny because, you know, guys go in there. So like, I'm going to hear Sonny Rollins rip the, for five hours. And he heard yeah. Sonny Rollins low B flats for five hours. You know, that's how yeah. he was testing the horn and testing to see if, if he could get his thing on the horn from the, lo from the lowest note. You know, yeah. that, so. that note has always spoke to me. You were saying like you, you focused in on that E, that e concert E flat from the trade, from the Blue Train album. Yeah, for me, yeah. it's, it's always been the low B flat for some reason. Like, it, it just tells me everything I need to know about it. Well, not everything, but it, it gives you a good idea of what's happening with the yeah. horn. The resonance of it, like all the air, you, you're going straight from the tip of the mouthpiece to out the bell. Yes. You know, you, you can feel the way it resonates. Like, there's certain notes, like E flat on the horn, like D flat concert, you know, that's really resonant. The E flat concert on the horn really resonant. There's certain notes that just kind of sit a little bit different. 
uh, right. in terms of uh, their harmonics on, on the horn. But th- there's just something about the B flat. Like if you if you have a horn that just has that big husky low B flat that you can really get around, and it has the same type of uh, presence whether you're su- subtoning or giving it a full B flat. You know, mm-hmm. that's just that's what I don't know. It's, there, there's something about it. Like I've I've always gotten a lot out of playing the B flat. So I know I haven't heard that story, but it's it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And actually you, you reminded me of something else I want to share with everyone. The, the 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 other important thing to consider when you're practicing long tones is to start the note with an air attack. Ha ha. Um and the, the saxophone player, I, I used to take lessons with with Ralph Alama, you know. Oh wow. And, and Ralph Ralph talks about I that was a purchase too. And I, I was studying with Eric Alexander, Ralph, Jimmy Green. But Ralph always talks about making sure you practice your hot ta tots. And hot ta, that's a classical exercise. But the hot ta ta thing, ha ta ta. And what's the common syllable in ha ta ta? It's ah, mm. right? Ah is the most open but projecting throat shape, I think. If you're O, mm. it's going to be a little softer and if you're e it's going to be a little pinched but in so ah is really important and that exercise starts with ha it's air it's air you're getting air there's a master class with eric alexander too where he talks about starting your sound with the air right because when you get that circle of uh the fuzz around the sound that's what he's right. talking about you put the air into that, that's when you have this full kind of ha quality. I notice a lot of students sometimes they want to get that big sound and they'll go with the ta because they're trying to articulate it. But half the t- most of the time, and I also as people like, you know, even on the 8 bit big band stuff, like, oh, that, you know, the solo you play on Gourmet Race or whatever, it's like, are you articulating? I'm like, no, no, I'm not. That's, that's all. Figure. And it, as if I'm playing a long tone here, right? That's all open. It's all, that's all fingers. And uh, to be honest with you, if I try to articulate any of that stuff, then that's when it starts to sound a little sloppy. Right. Because it's too many variables. Every once in a while, you know, maybe a, an articulation on one note here, one note there. But the way to get that big sound when you're playing fast or all that stuff is to actually, you want to work on your digits. And most of the time I'm thinking just open, no embouchure, embouchure, ha, and like try to just let the air flow through the horn, you know? And uh, like, like you said, like B flat, low B flat, that, that will, that will clear it all up. You know, become yeah. one with sit out there. Like, think of the uh, was that Ricola commercial or something up on the mountain? Oh, right, right, yeah, like you know, and then the same thing with the B, like, you can play around with both of the bell, the bell keys, the B and B. the low B flat, right? They're so different, like, they just resonate completely different. Yeah, you know the the B is I don't know I, I it's it's tough to put into words it's because uh, it's a sound I'm not thinking about words when I hear that you yeah. know it's to me it just seems like the B flat is much more round and maybe the B is like kind of uh, tighter maybe tighter yeah yeah I know exactly for, what you mean. for lack of a better word yeah yeah I know what you mean the B the B is a little it's interesting, like, the, I, yeah, B is fatter. B, the B flat also has almost like a more of an open quality to it. Like it can never right. end. B, B has a more like specific sound. Yeah. Feeling it's tougher to, it. to subtone too. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and you know what else is funny? Even right there in the example, when you did the subtone on the B and then tried to, play a brighter B the subtone B actually sounded louder to me than the brighter yeah 
See? Because you're more open. Yeah. So, I mean, I probably can't. This read is wacky right now. I'm probably. Yeah. Well, you want to start with, can everyone hear that? That even the yeah, air? Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you want to get that almost the subtone through the whole horn. Even the palm keys, high palm key, is almost as if you're subtoning. I mean, Eric talks about that too. Like, practice the quiet burn. If you're playing Cherokee or something, see yeah. if you can play, you know, Cherokee and B. Don't don't blast that, you know. See if you can. I mean, then you can turn it on. Yeah. I mean, the, somehow practicing that kind of control, that openness, makes the the loud. Uh, I don't know, uh, just a little more, you're more in control. You're more, yeah. uh, you're more, it, 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 it speaks better, you know? Right. Uh, I think so often we hear these great players with all this facility and, con and control and think like, oh, we got to like, you know. Push, <laughs> push, yeah, yeah, don't push. It's not, it's not coming from that. It's coming yeah. from, it's coming from a, uh, 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 a much more centered, uh, 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 letting let, letting the air speak through the horn, and then when you push, that's that's kind of that's kind of on top of of that basis that you're setting for yourself when you're practicing those low B flats, you know. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess from like a technical standpoint, if you actually think about how the sound is produced. If you pinch, you're actually reducing the area. Like with the facing curve, you're reducing right. the area that the reed has to work. Right. So you just kind of want to set it there. Like let it do its thing, you know? And, and just just enough pressure to create a seal and no more. Right. You know? Right. Even when even when you're flying around like that, you know, your, your, your bottom jaw is not like, you know, you don't see a lot of movement in the lip, in the embouchure. It's really stable, right? Like right. Flexible but stable, right? Right. And and that and that's also you know for me where the the ad, the extra benefit of like some of the scale exercises that I I practice come in because it's it's forcing me to keep the embouchure consistent and the same the entire time I'm practicing these exercises. It's it's forcing me to uh, have to not adjust, right? So one of the you know, and it's a silly scale exercise. I, I practice, I'll, you know, I'll just play it through every mode of the major scale. So if we're doing like low B flat, so I tried to get that as fast as I could in every key, whole range right. of horn and call. But I wasn't just doing that to get the digits together. I'm doing that. I'm watching to make sure that my embouchure isn't changing, right? Right. That the whole time I'm doing that, I'm kind of just, uh, right? So. Eventually you get, you get to that place, right? And then you mix it around, mix and match, you plus, uh, apply other lines you've already started to train yourself to keep this stable. Right. right. And, and so you, you kind of try to create exercises or games for yourself where it's going to force you to, to ha to keep that kind of relaxed feeling. Uh, so you don't just hear some train line and try to, uh, you know, right. force it. it. <laughs> yeah. Force um, and then that takes time. 
that takes yeah. time. You know, that takes some time because uh, uh, through that process, I learned, you know, you, and it's not just about me. It's, you know, of course not. It's, 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 it's about, it's about putting yourself in the shoes of the great players. And through that process, you learn who you are. Right. And, and, and for me, what I learned really is that, you know, Brecker, especially, and then train have a little more of a in the moment thing through this process. I kind of found that my gift, or at least I feel is to have a little more of a flow in my playing. And I kind of dawned on me, maybe like even four or five years ago, I'm never going to have, you know, even for all the Brecker stuff that I try to have together, Right. Uh, I'm never going to have that level of uh, uh, in the Spot, moment. Yeah, the way, the way, yeah. It's not, it's not, that's not me. What, what, what I have, what my, my gift as, 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 as a soul on this planet or whatever you want to say is, is a flow. And, and that's a very real thing that I learned. And I right. only learned through putting myself through that process. And it's not, I don't feel like it's a defeat or anything. It's just right. that I listen back to myself and I'm playing the same thing. And I put myself, I learned that I have a flow that, that other people won't be able to mess with. So right. for students out there, you might find you have more of a aggressive attack than Brecker, or you might have more of a uh, grounded time than train you may, but, the point is, is that you have put yourself in these positions to learn who you are, right. what you're, um, you know, so that's deep. But, yeah, no, no, that's, yeah. yeah, I was just like, let that go. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that was, yeah. yeah, that's, that's definitely where it's at, man. You have to like test yourself, you know, I mean, you can, you can use whatever, you know, like if you never know if you can lift 300 pounds, if you can, if you don't try. Right. You know right. what I mean? You get to see where you're at. And I mean, some of these tasks that you're talking about, like to have really rock solid time with all this other stuff going on, that is a debate. That's a quality that's inside of you. That I mean, you can work on it, but that's something that has to be inside of you. You know, that, yeah. that level of spontaneity that you're talking about with Brecker, that just has to be inside of you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 And yeah. you, you, but 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 see that's the beauty of it, also because you and and this is a this is a deeper uh, discussion about oh should you should you copy people or like should you learn someone's licks and the point is the point is is that if you are really you, right or whatever yeah. that means whatever that means anyway but like if you are really you, even if I take all of those. Brecker licks. I'm still going to be me. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you, you cannot really copy someone. That's the, right. that's, that's the point for everyone. This whole, no, Oh, don't, he just sounds like a copycat of so-and-so or blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. If you are really, really inside the music, you are going to sound similar to other people, but if you were really inside it, you are only going to be you. Right. No, that dude, that's that's so spot on. Like, yeah, I I have specific like Brecker things that I've taken right out of his book and stuff. But when yeah. I play it, it doesn't sound anything like it. It's beautiful. No. Like, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, and that, and, but and that's that's the that's the beauty of it. It's it's like, uh, you know, you're 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 here to absorb the things you like and kind of put it back into the universe in your own way. Right. And it's almost, it's half the time, it's almost not even under your control. Our, it's almost like our job is just to absorb and, and, and put, put it back out there. Yeah. You know? And the, now we're getting even deeper for how I feel about the world and everything, but we're, we're there. So I'll, I'll tell yeah. everyone, I, I, I believe that we are all connected and we are all part of the same thing 
we just are uh, in different forms of it. You know, I, I believe that there's a, a underlying connection between all of us. And it's not just a, a spiritual philosophy. It's actually scientifically true because what do they say that the, the breath that, you know, uh, George Washington or Martin Luther King, or they, they, they're, 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 those molecules are stuff that we're still breathing now. Yeah. They've actually proved, proven that. So yeah. it's all still here, right? Yeah. All, we're, we're all just different forms of the same thing. You yeah. know? So, you know, uh, keep that in mind. I totally dig. You can only be you. You can only yeah. be you. Exactly. So, Michael, is there? Do we have any questions uh, from the listeners? And I think we should maybe play one before we. If we don't have any questions, we'll play one. It'll be a shame if we didn't play a little bit. Maybe we could like yeah. trade, trade over some blues or something. Michael, you you there, man? Yes, I'm here. Uh, so, no any- questions in right now. But um, I just want to say it's so many nuggets that you guys have dropped today at me. I love how you talk about being original and hearing your sound, identifying your sound. I mean, that that is amazing. And just about I'm, I'm not a saxophone player, but, you know, as a trumpet player, as a keyboard player, I'm still taking nuggets from you guys. So um, awesome, awesome, awesome. But I agree. It would be great if we can hear something today before you leave. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So maybe uh, take uh, the culture. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. I don't know if we could do this at the same time. I, I mean, no, should we just like so? So let's trade. Uh, yeah, let's trade. Um. Uh, 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 so we'll trade fours over the head. Okay. And then, and then trade trade courses soloing. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
heard it here first it's the next album jeremy carter and sam dylan album will be out next week i'm bootlegging it right now so, <laughs> you know we did have one question come in uh you mentioned something about taking a risk you know and not caring what you know people think uh what was something that helped you to start taking more of a risk to go for it you know and not um operating in fear i guess you can say Oh, um, oh yeah go ahead yeah yeah I, I guess we can both add, add a little something to that um uh one thing just the experience of, of playing with with other musicians who were that were better than me you know like if you when, when you like all the times when i went up to new york right i um there's just so many cooking musicians and then when you get like kind of the okay or you get the you get the seal of approval or stamp of approval from someone that you respect. Um, that that goes a long way to to making you feel like you deserve to 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 be able to do what you whatever you want to do and, and you belong. And then the other thing I would say is just relying uh, on your other musicians, like seeing how magical this whole experience can be if you work you know, in tandem with others, like if it's kind of like you're on a team, you know what I mean? Like they, they're counting on you to do whatever it is you do. There's a reason that you're there. You've been selected for the ensemble, you know, so it, it's almost like kind of a duty to be free. You know, it's not like a pressure situation. They want, there's a reason that you're there. So just kind of relying on, on the camaraderie uh, between you and your fellow musicians, I think goes a long way to uh, just just being free and not really caring, you know, it, it's 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 not. Uh, I mean, it is important, but I mean, there are things that, like if you're a fighter pilot, if you're a firefighter, if you you know, there's other professions where if you're a, a neurological surgeon, you know, that this this high pressure, and uh, I just I think that the the what we're doing is meant. It like is if we're doing what if we're doing this thing properly, there's a lot of freedom. It has total freedom. 
you know, it's just, it's necessary. What helps you get there? Just the belief that you, you deserve to be there. You belong. Yeah. yeah I, I, I agree with that. You need to, you need to understand that we are, are really uh, little pebbles on the top of a whole mountain yeah. of greatness. So it really, you should feel like you're kind of riding on the shoulders of greatness. And that's at least how I feel. So there's, there is a level, I think that, you know, when you're becoming a developing player, there is a understandable level of fear that people might deal with when they first come to a place where they're granted that level of freedom, because you are, all of a sudden put in a position where, wow, I can do whatever I want. Are you really, really? Yeah. And, and you're, you're, you're like, Oh, really? I can do whatever. Really? And the answer is yes, you can. But you know, it's that, it's that funny place because it's the first time you kind of realize that your father is a human being. <laughs> He's not perfect, you know, right. because, because there's th that when, you know, you grow up and you want to, you want to you, you want to make sure that that you are paying respect and giving the credit to to what's come before you and that's a definite real fear that i think all of us go through as artists because we carry the lessons with the great players that come before us so there's this interesting balance that we get to of kind of getting enough out of the the fathers and, and mothers of, of the, of the history to a point where we are almost feeling like it's time for us to be ourselves, to be free. And that's a delicate balance, you know? So you have to ask yourself where the fear is coming from though, because if you're surrounded by people who are telling you, no, 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 you can't do that just for whatever reason, that's not good. But if you're around someone that's saying, Hey, look, you know, maybe you want, might want to check out this player first before you just start making no sense in what you're doing. That might be a valid point. However, if you want to put yourself in a situation where you're completely just playing nonsense, there's a level of that that is good, too. Yeah. That you need to be able to experience as well. So it, you, you, if you're feeling fearful when you're on the bandstand it's not just you know not to sound cliche but it's not fear itself you know you got to ask yourself where the fear is coming from and think about it on, in a deep on a deeper level you know and and understand that we're in a profession where self-expression and your personal development is uh is paramount so actually you should start getting in a process of asking yourself why you're afraid, because that will help you to become even freer, actually, you know, but don't be afraid. That's the point. Don't be afraid. Right. But if yeah. you are, address it, address it, address it yeah. and ask yourself why, why, if you know why, then you can deal with it. Don't just deal with it. I'm afraid, you know, you ask yourself, well, why are you feeling that way? Maybe you didn't practice enough. Maybe you don't, you don't sound how you want to sound. Did someone else make you afraid? Why are you afraid? And then think about all those things. If you're afraid because you don't sound good enough, well, get back in the shed. Yeah. <laughs> great you know? answer. Great answer. Great answer. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's all the questions we have today, but all right. I'll tell you, we really, really enjoyed the session today, guys. I mean, incredible musicians, incredible educators, Sam Dillon and the great Jeremy Carter. 
Um, I just want to remind everyone, if you enjoyed today's session, um, tune in, you know, stay tuned in with us because there's more sessions coming your way. And guess what? They are free. Can you believe this is a free session where you can interact with these great musicians? Uh, and they're going to be posted at www.clearwaterjazz.com slash education. And you know what? We also would love to hear some feedback or if you have a topic you want to suggest just for a future session, or you just want to tell us how much you enjoyed this session, you can email us at info at clearwaterjazz.com. Spread the word, everybody. There's some awesome things happening here with Clearwater Jazz. Thank you once again, Sam Dillon. Thank you once again, Jeremy Carter. We're looking forward to seeing more performances in the near future. I've been your host, Michael Canodal. And until next time, like we always say, everybody, keep it swinging. Bye-bye. <laughs>